1 John 4 and 1, it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirit whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. And so you guys, we have to try the spirit by the spirit. That inner witness inside of us should tell us, is that of God, is that not of God? So we have to try the spirit by the spirit. In Genesis 2, 16 and 17, it says this, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou may eat of freely but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it for in that day thou shalt surely die and God began to speak to me about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil when Adam and Eve fell then everything that man began to do we began to judge things by good and evil and how we judge as men good and evil right the Bible says our righteousness is that of filthy rags so what happens is I'm reminded of uh, when I was in high school there was a, a girl that slept around with a lot of guys and I remember this one girl that would always talk about her and call her certain names but she had a boyfriend and she would say you know I only sleep with my boyfriend but check this out you're a fornicator just like she was a fornicator that's why God says don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil see there were two pieces of fruit on that tree there was evil and there was good and I believe there are more people in hell right now that have eaten from eating good think I'm doing good things but are they God things and see, before the fall, they were walking in perfect relationship with God. They were righteous. And he says, I don't want you living off a tree trying to discern who's gooder than the other person. I know that's not good English. But you understand what I'm saying? So we have to judge these things by the Spirit. Here's another big problem that I see in the body of Christ. And that is, I call it, God told me it's an identity crisis. And basically, we're making decisions based on our color. And so this has been a big thing that I have noticed. Being a black man, I can really talk about this from our experience, from the experience of being a black man. Because what I see black people doing is making decisions based on their blackness. I ask a question sometimes and people think, well, Brother Troy, this is, you're just having a play on words. It's not a play on words. I ask people, do you consider yourself a white Christian or a Christian that happens to be white? Do you consider yourself a Latino Christian or a Christian that happens to be Latino? Do you consider yourself a black Christian or a Christian that happens to be black? Do you consider yourself an Asian Christian or a Christian that happens to be Asian? And you would think that's a play on words it really isn't God is trying to make a point here God says whatever you put first there that's what's going to be first in Matthew 6 and 21 it says for where a man's treasure is there his heart will be also so what I have been noticing is that if you tell me that you're a black Christian there's a possibility that you will put your blackness before your Christian I have seen this happen so many times I wasn't planning on saying this today, but I think it's so important right now that I do. I was talking to some people, we were here at the end of last week, but about 25 years ago, it was right before a presidential election, and one of the networks that do 24-hour news did a poll of registered black voters. Now, this was 25 years ago. Now, these, now these, this poll has changed, and the numbers have changed, but this is very interesting, and this really got me started on my journey with God, with the political and God. They asked them six questions on morality, but only remember three and the first question was is homosexuality morally wrong 86 percent that responded these are just black americans registered voters 86 percent yes it's morally wrong the next question they asked them was is abortion morally wrong same response 86 percent said yes it's morally wrong here was the last question they asked in the upcoming election, who are they going to support for president? And 95% of them polled was going to vote for the candidate that was pro-homosexual rights and pro-abortion. You guys are almost fell out of my chair because I, I just immediately said, well, God, this makes no sense. I mean, in the poll, in their heart of hearts, they're saying that they know these things are wrong, but they're stepping over that truth in their heart and they're voting for the person that goes against their own morality in your heart. And I said, God, why is this so? And he said, one of them is Troy. One of the reasons is there is an identity crisis and they are putting their color before their Christianity. And when you do that, when you make decisions out of the wrong mindset what actually happens is you have made an idol out of your own ethnicity what is an idol an idol is something that you erect and put before god we see that in that poll right another one of the things the lord told me the reason why this is is he said tradition jesus said the traditions of men make the word of god none effect 
But you know what? That's the reason why we have been voting the way we do. You know why? Mama voted that way. We've always voted that way. Almost a knee-jerk reaction. We don't even think about it. But in that poll, see, when I read that poll, it's real. When I heard that, I was like, God, this makes no sense. But God began, and I asked, began to ask him, God, why is this? And he said, this is the reason why. One is tradition. But Jesus' words ring true. He said, the traditions of men make the word of God none of that. We see it right there in the poll. Because tradition was so strong that even in their hearts, they knew these things were wrong. But they still said, you know what? I got to go and vote for this person. And here's where the enemy fools us. He gets us to believe that we're helping ourselves. Because he gets us focused on, now I'm going to talk as a black man, okay? Now you're white, you're Hispanic, you, you, can, you, can move, you can go in your own way, okay? He gets us to believe that if I vote this way, it's going to help me as a black man. And it actually doesn't. The name of this message is Covenants, Curses, and the Cornerstone. And I haven't even, I'm so off base right now in the order I'm going to do this. But here's the thing. This is what you got to understand. Voting is an act of your will. It is an act of your will. You can make covenant with a cursed thing. And so here in this poll, we see they know these things are wrong. But when you step over that truth and go into that voting booth and you cast or you put a, you circle in your pencil, that is an act of your will and you are making covenant with a cursed thing. Now you got to understand covenant. And if you don't under, understand covenant, this won't mean anything to you. Because covenant is so powerful. When me and my wife got married, we went into a covenant. It's kind of like a, a spiritual contract, right? A, a pact or a treaty. And with a covenant, whatever is hers is mine. Whatever is mine is hers. Jesus takes our sin, our sickness, our disease. We get salvation, wholeness, healing. That's covenant. So check this out. When you go vote, which is an act of your will, for somebody that goes against the will of God, and you know it, you have made covenant with a cursed thing, and that curse comes upon Upon you. I can prove it because I look at the African American community. We are the only ones that about in a 95% clip vote one way. And I look at the things that are going on and even a lot of things that they're talking about right now and out in the streets fighting against. And look, it was wrong. What, 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 what happened and what's been going on in this nation for years? It's wrong. But some of what's going on is a covenant with a cursed thing. Listen, we black people have been 13% of the population in America for like 60 years. I was in a barber shop once and the guy was complaining. Yeah, you know, Whitey's after us, man. We've been 13% of the population for 60 years. And you know, I usually go to barber shop, but don't say nothing, because I do want to get out alive. I don't want the good cut to tighten me up, tighten the brother up, you know. But this particular day, Holy Spirit said, you got to say something. I said, you want to know why? We're only 13% of the population. I said, I'm going to give you two good reasons why. Number one is abortion. I said, with 13% of the population, but every year annually, 36 to 39% of all abortions are done on black babies. But you keep voting, and I just said it. I got up out my chair, and when I get up on my chair, I feel the anointing. I said, but you keep voting, and there's women and men, this place is packed, it's a Saturday. I said, but you keep voting for people that believe in this legalized genocide. You have made covenant with a curse thing. So the curse that's on that party has come upon you because you have made covenant with it. And if you want to get that curse off of you, first of all, repent and then turn and say, God, I won't vote that way no more. Do you know we could change, as Christians just voted like Christians, we could change politics. We could change in no time. What if we just made a stance? What if every Christian, I don't care what color, creed, where you came from, say as long as you believe in killing babies in the womb, you won't get, I won't even look at you. You won't get a dollar, I won't even, I'll turn away, I won't even look at you. If you believe in marriage, that's anything other than God's blueprint. For this reason shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his own wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's the blueprint. I ain't seen nothing else in the word that contradicts that. If we did that, the parties couldn't win any major elections if they went against that. But you know what Christians do? We'd rather wave the white flag too hard. They're calling me homophobe, xenophobe, every kind of foe. You call me what you want to. I ain't making covenant with this thing. So there's an identity crisis. Can I tell y'all something? Let me, let me read these two scriptures to you. Go to Galatians 3, 27 and 28. It says, for as many of you have been baptized in the Christ, you have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. 
because you are all one in Christ Jesus. There is no color in the kingdom. Did I hear an amen? Somebody gave me an amen. There's no color in the kingdom. Let me read one more. Colossians 3, 10 and 11. And have put on the new spiritual self who is being continually renewed in true knowledge in the image of him who created the new self. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek, which means Gentile or Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, nor between nations, whether barbarian or Scythian, nor in status slave or free, but Christ Christ is all and in all, so believers are equal in Christ without distinction. There is no color in the kingdom. There's no color in the kingdom. So if you can't make your decision based on this, I can't make my decision. This is just a dirt suit. Y'all know there's five different colors of dirt. Anybody remember all there's like red dirt, black dirt, brown dirt, white dirt. Guess what? We were made from dirt. When we die, guess what happens to this flesh? It goes back to what? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, right? This is just the dirt suit, but that's not who we identify with in the kingdom. And so Jesus in Matthew 12, 46 through 50, I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to paraphrase it. It's also an account in Mark 3. Jesus is teaching a bunch of people, and I believe he's, I don't, I don't know if he's in a house or someplace like that, but he's teaching and there's a great multitude of people. His mother comes and his brother comes and they want to talk to him. So one of his disciples comes up to him and they say, Master, your mother and your brother is outside and they want to speak to you. Jesus answers. He gets this very strange, peculiar answer. He says, who is my mother and who is my brother? Now, y'all don't think Jesus knew Mary was his mother and who his half brother was is in the natural. But that's a very peculiar answer, isn't it? But he goes on to say, he said, those that do the will of my father are my sister, my brother, and my mother. Are you doing the will of the father? You're my brother. You doing the will of the father? You're my sister. See, you can't base this on color. You can't vote for somebody based on color. Are they doing the will of the father? That's the only way that we can do this, you guys. So who are we really then? See, we one time I was uh, riding in my car. This was a number of years ago. And God spoke something. To, God speaks to me so much when I'm riding in the car. Anybody else can testify that? But this one, y'all, you're talking about peculiar? Jesus said something peculiar. God said to me, he said, I want you to stop thinking of yourself as a black man. I said, what? He said, stop thinking of yourself as a black man. I said, why, Lord? He said, you're a kingdom citizen. And then he took me to a couple scriptures. Hebrews 11 and 13. You know, Hebrews 11 is the chapter that we call the Hall of Fame. It says that we're now strangers, pilgrims, exiles on the earth. Now we're just strangers passing through. While we're here, we get kingdom assignments. We get kingdom assignments. Y'all, I have figured out that God is, a, I, I really have just recently come to this revelation. He's an investor. He's an investor. Y'all remember the parable about the talents? He gave one one talent. He gave one two talents. He gave one five talents. And I know that when you read that, no, talents means a, a measure of money, but I also mean it believes the gifts, talents, and abilities that God gives you while you're on the earth. And he was not mad with the guy with the one talent because he only had one talent. That's not why he was mad. He was mad because he did not give him a return on his investment. And so what God does from the time you say I do to Jesus, he starts investing in you. He sends you to a church. You get your foundation and your doctrine, right? And then every place you go, he, he, he puts something else. He's building on you. But eventually God says, go give me a return on my investment. So I ask everybody in here right now, what are you giving God back? See, he's going to judge you one day. He was going to say, you could write. Where was that book? It was in you. I put the gifts, talents, and abilities in you. What are you supposed to be doing for Jesus? He's an investor. God is an investor. He said, I want to return on my investment. So while you're on the earth, what God does is he, he, say, he gives you kingdom assignments. See, if you think of you, see, this is what happened. When I stopped looking at myself as a black man and started looking at myself as a kingdom citizen, I started seeing everything through the eyes of the kingdom, through everything through the eyes of the king and the decrees he left me. If it don't line up with this word, I ain't with it. Somebody said to me one time, you ain't down with the cause. You ain't down with the brothers. I said, man, I'm down with the kingdom. You ain't getting me in that trap because Satan will deceive you if you put your ethnicity before your Christianity. Ephesians 2 and 19 says, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints in the household of God. 
citizens of God's kingdom. I love this scripture here. 1 Peter 2 and 9 says, you're a chosen generation. That word generation there actually means race. You're a chosen race. So when you get saved, you become, the Bible says you're a new creature. We're a whole new race. We Christ race. We kingdom people. He said, you're a holy generation. And you know what? Not only are you a, a chosen generation, mean you're a new race, but you're also a chosen generation. A little bit different. See, this is what I believe. Because time means nothing with God. God is eternal. God can look throughout the eons of time, and he did. See, you weren't born in the 1300s or the 1400s. God had you here for now, and he equipped you for this time and this season. I promise you, you're equipped for this time and this season. The Bible said he won't put more on you than you can bear. And the gifts that you have, they're for now. I don't know what God is doing with you, dealing with you about, but what he's giving you is for the now. Now faith is a royal priesthood. Hebrews 4 talks about Jesus being our great high priest. You guys, we are from royalty, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Leviticus 11 and 44 and 1 Peter 1 and 16, it says, God says, be ye holy for I am holy. Y'all want to know what's happened with the churches? When I grew up, there was such talk about holiness, sanctification. We have thrown out the baby with the bath water. I'm stunned by how little emphasis there is on holiness today. God says, be holy, for I am holy. Listen, it may be impossible to attain in these earth suits complete holiness, but God says, strive for it. That's my nature. You know, the, the church that we, D and I, just, we left. We, we were there a little over three years. And one of the things that really bothered us in our spirit was there was too much excuses for sin and not a standard for holiness. If you're the leader of a church and you don't put any standard for holiness, the people will never strive to attain it. A peculiar people. See, you, we need to be peculiar. In James 4 and 4, it says to be a friend of the world is to be an enmity of God. That means at war with God. Whoever, therefore, is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. See, listen, if the world don't think you're strange, something wrong in your walk with Jesus. I remember a number of years ago, I was coming through a Walmart buying some stuff, and on the magazine rack, there was a picture of T.D. Jakes standing there, probably in about a $5,000 suit, and it said, America's Preacher. Y'all, the Holy Spirit got all over me. If the world is acknowledging you as America's Preacher, you ain't preaching nothing. So for that to happen, the Bible says to be a friend of the world is to be at enmity with God. You better wake up. Romans 8, 6 through 8, it says, So to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because a carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. God. You guys, here's the key right here. You got to stay spiritually minded. And Satan is a master of getting you out of the spirit mind and into the natural mind. Man, he is a master at doing this. So right now, what's going on? I tell you, I go and talk to my the guy that cuts my hair. He's actually a minister. He used to pastor a church at one time. And I go in to get my hair cut this last time, and he started talking about, and they need to be riding in white neighborhoods. Let's not be breaking up our neighborhood. And I said, dude, you need to get out the flesh. You're in the fleshly mind. And he just kept going on. He kept bucking me and going. I said, dude, you're in the fleshly mind. You're a man of God. And I had to start giving him scriptures. I said, no. And so what, let me, let me tell you how in every race of people, y'all ever heard this story of Pavlov's dog. You remember that story that in science they taught us about that like he had a dog and whenever he would feed the dog he would ring a bell. And so after a while he wouldn't even have to bring the food. If he rang the bell the dog would be begin to salivate. Well, it's the same thing with every race of people. There are certain words that get us out of our spiritual mind and in our natural mind. So with black people it's racism, civil rights, Hispanic people, immigration. And what he has been so successful in doing is when we go in to vote, we leave our spiritual mind, he gets us to get in our natural mind, and we make the decision in our natural mind and not in our spiritual mind. So as we're looking at these things that's going on right now in the world, make sure that we stay spiritually minded. We talked about covenants. I want to talk a little bit about that. What is a covenant? A covenant is made of two words, the Hebrew word, brit, which means pact or treaty, and ish, which means man or the, the spirit man. So it's a spiritual pact or treaty with man. It means as a verb to be fettered or linked up 
two. In kingdom terms, it's a spiritual contract. That's what a covenant is. Covenants are always sealed or ratified in blood. We see this in the Old Testament in Leviticus 16 and 15. I'm not going to read that, but it, the priest would take the blood of goats or bulls and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. And where I got Genesis 3 and 21, when God, when Adam and Eve both fell, he said that he made them coats of skin. And you guys, that represented God killed an animal. So we see a blood sacrifice there, right? Most scholars believe probably that first animal that was killed was a lamb because it was the first typology that we see of Jesus. In the New Testament, in John 1 and 29, John the Baptist, when he's baptizing people, he sees Jesus. And I, it had to be by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. But he says, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes the way the sins of the world and they understood in Jewish culture that that lamb was used as a blood sacrifice right Romans 10 9 and 10 it's a very popular scripture it says that if thou will confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead thou shall be saved for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation quite literally you guys in the spirit realm this is our marriage vow you speak with your mouth you believe in your heart that Jesus was raised from the dead. You speak with your mouth. The marriage covenant is the thing that God gives us to best understand this covenant that Christ has with his church. And when you actually say your wedding vows, you're sealing it with your word. But then there's got to be one more thing that seals that, that ratifies that covenant. That's a blood sacrifice. And so, you know, when, when you get married, and if both of your virgins the way God wants it to be at the beginning, and I'm not going to get graphic here, but you know there ends up being in intercourse a, a blood sacrifice. It's ratified in blood. Amen? Abortion. The blood that is shed by these kids. You know, we know in the Old Testament, Israel got in trouble with God passing their, with, you know, worshiping the Molech, passing their children through the fire. But there's a blood sack for every child that blood is shed in this country. I think that covenants are being made with demons. In Proverbs uh, 6 and 17, when it's talking about the seven things that God hates, it says he hates hands that shed innocent blood. Deuteronomy 27 and 25 said, Cursed is anyone who accepts a bribe to kill an innocent person. To accept a bribe. What's the bribe? Can I tell you what it is? The bribe that Satan offers? Convenience. You ain't got time to raise no baby. This is too inconvenient. I'm too young. I still want to go college. There's still things I want to do. That's the bribe he offers you. Get rid of it. Kill it. You ain't got time for this. Blood sacrifice. All right, y'all, I'm about to go somewhere, and um, but this has to be said. It's, I'm talking to you about tattoos and piercings. I want to talk about this. The Lord has had this on my heart for a, a number of years. I believe that when people get tattoos and when they get multiple piercings, blood is shed. I want you to think about this. And I believe that people are making covenants with demons and don't realize it. When you get tattoos, you are making open portals for demons to come inside of you. I saw a um, on YouTube a couple years ago, and I sat all my kids down. It was a young lady who was going, they were doing a deliverance service. She was full of demons. And the guy, after he made, that was doing the deliverance service, he asked her, he made the demon, he said, what's your name? He made the demon tell him his name. He said, how did you enter her? And she's, the demon is speaking through her. He said, through her tattoo. And the tattoo she had was a cute little butterfly. Fly, Texas. And I made all my kids, all four of them, sit down and watch that. I said, you guys, I'm just telling you what the Lord is showing me. Don't do it. Listen, I'm going to read you scripture on this. ain't Brother Troy. Leviticus 19 and 28. You shall make no cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. You shall make no cuts on your body in mourning for the dead, nor make any tattoo marks on yourself. I am the Lord. I like what he said, I am the Lord. In other in other words, I'm the final authority on this. I'm the final authority on this. So like I said, he, he's trying, like I said, when you're getting a tattoo, now I've never had one, but I understand it hurts. But here's the thing, you're shedding blood. See this covenant thing, you guys, is very serious. It has been an explosion in the last 20 years with this. Why has Satan made this, they call it body art. Why has he made this so popular? Listen, I know people that get one, and that's how I know that there's a spirit that enters, and they say, I can't wait to get my next one, and then they say, I can't wait to get my next one, and I can't wait, and I'm going to get one right here, and then I'm going to get one right here. See, because every time you get one, more demons 
are entering inside of you. Now look, if you did some things while you were unsaved, no problem. But I'm going to tell you something. Every single time God brings the truth to you, it makes you come to a fork in the road. And one of those roads is tradition. I'm going to stay right here. I hear what you're saying, but I'm going to get my next task. The other road is truth. And, and it's this struggle inside your spirit because you got to decide, do I stay on this road of tradition or do I go down this road of truth? Let me read one more scripture to you. Psalms 139, 13 and 14. David, the psalmist, is speaking to the Lord. He says, for you formed me in my inner parts and the innermost parts. You knit me together. This is in the Amplified. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will give thanks and praise to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. Can I tell you something? You are already perfect. He made you in your mother's womb exactly how he wanted you to be. You don't need a rose. You don't need a butterfly. You don't need a skull. You don't need your mom that's gone on to be with the Lord, her face. You don't need your favorite football team. He said you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Why are you messing this up? That's Satan. Open their eyes, Lord. Now listen, there might be some people here that's got tattoos, and there might be some spirits bothering you, and you ain't even know why they're bothering you. How come I can't get over this pornography? How come I keep having nightmares? There might just need, you might just need to have a deliverance service one day. Mark 5, 1 through 5. And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him a man out of the tomb, a man with an unclean spirit, who had been dwelling amongst the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying, and cutting himself with stones. You guys, every time I see in the scriptures where there's cutting, piercing, poking of the skin, there is demonic activity involved. But I had to bring that up because listen, you guys, anywhere that we will not shine light, the light of God's truth, Satan says, I'll take that territory and darkness will be. And because churches are not teaching about this, and preaching about this and instructing their flock. I've even heard some churches say, well, you know, it's Old Testament. You preach other stuff out of the Old Testament, but we have to shine light on this stuff because darkness will prevail. Wherever light won't go, darkness prevails. And I'm telling you guys, this is of the enemy. There's three kinds of covenants. There's conditional covenants, and we see that in 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. He says, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. That's a conditional covenant. If there's that big if. I hear you preach on it all. You've been using that word. If, my people. Look at John 15 and 5. Jesus says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If a man abides in me, if a man abides not in me, he is cast as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire to be burned. Those are conditional covenants. And I believe that scripture is talking about salvation in John 15 and 5. Then you got unconditional covenants. And then there's everlasting covenants, like the rainbow. God said, I'll never destroy the earth again with rain. Then there's eternal life. You guys, once we're there, it ain't no more. I mean, that's it. It's eternal. That's an everlasting covenant. Curses. A curse is a solemn utterance intended to invoke supernatural power to inflict harm or punishment upon someone or something. What things are curses? Famines, droughts, floods, violent storms like tornadoes and hurricanes. And then you have pestilence, which are like we're going through right now, COVID-19, viruses or diseases that lead to pandemics. I was looking at the word pandemic when I was writing it down. The Holy Spirit showed me something. Pan, you know, that word means fear. And then I looked at the last letters. It almost looks like demons. Pandemic, fear demons because that's what they bring up. Whole nation in fear. How does one catch a curse? Can you catch a curse? You can catch a cold, right? You can catch a curse. First way, blatant disobedience to the word of God. 
Anyone who ignored and set aside the law of Moses is put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much greater do you think he he will deserve who has rejected and trampled underfoot the Son of God and has considered considered unclean and common the blood of the covenant that sanctified him and has insulted the spirit of grace. Y'all, this is talking about you know, you say you've been saved, been walking with God, and you turn back to the world. That's what he's talking about. You can catch a curse. And then finally, you can make covenant with a cursed thing. And we talked about that, right? So there is no reason that we should ever, as righteous people, be in agreement with abortion, promoting homosexuality or transgenderism. Don't make covenant with those people. Finally, I want to talk to you about the last thing I'm going to talk to you about is the chief cornerstone. Let me read um, 1 Peter 2, 2, 4 through 8. Wherefore, also, it is contained in the scriptures, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believes on him shall not be confounded or confused. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which is di are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient. You guys, Jesus is our chief cornerstone. He said that the stone that the builders rejected, that means his, the Jewish people, he came to them first, but they rejected him. But God said, I have made him the chief corner. Is there anybody here that's a builder? You know when you're laying that foundation, there's one corner that is your chief cornerstone. Am I right? And you measure everything against that corner. That's, that's the chief corner. That's what he's talking about with Jesus. So when you're measuring it against the cornerstone, if you're saying, okay, I'm white and I think I'm better than other people because I'm white. You know what the corner, you know what he does? He has, I got to tap him back down. He, he's above me right here. He thinks he's above. But what if you're somebody say, you know what? I'm depressed and I feel like killing myself. He's, no, no, that's below the, the corner. That's, that's not lined up either. Jesus said, now we got to tap you back up. But everything in life has to be based on that cornerstone. I got to line it up with Jesus. He's the chief cornerstone. Does it, does it line up? Is it too high over here? Is it too low? If you stay in that word and keep your mind on him, you'll always have everything lined with the chief cornerstone. So Jesus is either going to be your firm foundation or he's going to be a stumbling block. Look, I'm going to tell you something. This was a hard word today. And you don't have to accept all of it. You know what? Some of it, you know, you can, it can become a stumbling block to you. I want to receive it. He can either be your rock of ages or he can be your rock of offense. You can get offended by the truth. Don't be fooled by what's going on. The chief principality that's in operation in our nation right now is the spirit of Leviathan. And if you don't know what the spirit of Leviathan is, do a little research. It's in the Bible five times. But it's in Job is the account that we look at the most. But it's a demonic spirit, and it twists words. That spirit, it goes after marriages. Look, I, as soon as you say, I do, and God seals that covenant with you with your words, and we talked about all that, the spirit of Leviathan comes in, and through communication, the Bible calls Satan the prince of the power of the air. What's being said in the airway? What's coming on over television and radio? You want to see it in operation? I could put a TV, this TV right here, have it on Fox. This TV over here, have it on CNN. And you will see the spirit of Leviathan at work. What that spirit is trying to do is kill that marriage. You've got to learn how to recognize the spirit of Leviathan. Right now, he's trying to destroy the nation, and it's over color and stuff like that. That's why, I talk, why God had me speak about that today. I hope the Lord spoke to your heart today. Amen. Amen.